Welcome to uh, this session on what do researchers really want from publishers as part of the Society for Scholarly Publishing Virtual Library. Next slide, please. I'm very happy to welcome our speakers. I'm Alice Meadows. Um, I'm at NISO. I'm their Director of Community Engagement. Um, and we're very lucky to have a wonderful, diverse group of speakers, all of whom have experience as both researchers and publishers. They're going to introduce themselves in a bit more detail in a moment. But briefly, we have Anna Heredia, who's at ORCID and based in Brazil. Haseeb Irfanula, who's a consultant based in Bangladesh. Phil Jones, who is also a consultant based in the UK at Double L Digital. Milka Kostic, who um, is a former researcher and publisher and now based at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in the USA, and Karen Wolf, who runs the Omohundro Institute in the USA as well. Before um, our speakers introduce themselves in more detail, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about um, the why of this session. Um, and it was really inspired by, uh, in fact, a keynote that Milka gave last year at um, the editorial manager uh, user group meeting, um, in which he challenged what researchers want from publishers or what publishers think researchers want from them. It was a fantastic keynote and we had a wonderful conversation afterwards, which ended up um, forming the basis for a uh, post on the Scully Kitchen, a, an interview that I did with Milka about what do researchers want from publishers. And I've pasted here a few of the comments um, from that post, which generated quite a lot of discussion. And you can see that there's really no agreement about what um, either researchers or publishers think they should be doing. So, you know, what, why do publishers think they're doing a good job? Well, Dr. Kostic, is not satisfied. Um, the problem is that some people think publishing is about serving authors, but actually it's about publishing, or asking publishing to reform these types of issues um, is asking the tail to wag the dog because publishing is a reactive service industry. So which of these is actually the truth, or probably a little bit of all of them, but this is where the inspiration for this discussion has come from, really. Another challenge that we all wanted to make sure that you were very aware of um, before we plunge into the detail is that, of course, research and publishing are very, very heterogeneous. Um, and just as some examples, publishers vary enormously in terms of their size, their business models, their governance, some are for profit, some are not for profit. They vary in terms of the types and breadths of publications and other outputs that they publish. And researchers equally varied by discipline, by geography, by career stage, and they also wear multiple hats. They may be um, uh, a researcher that's uh, acting as an author or a reviewer or a re reader or some combination of all of those. So we know that in this discussion, we can't <laughs> barely scratch the surface of, of all this um, heterogeneity, but by um, uh, inviting speakers who collectively represent quite a a wonderful real diversity of this sort of experience and, and breadth um, of this very heterogeneous world that we work in. I'm hoping that we can have a little bit, um, do a little bit of unpicking of some of the challenges and, and what this might mean for researchers and particularly for publishers. So I'm now going to hand over to each of the um, speakers to introduce themselves. And we're going to start with Milka because as I say, she was kind of the inspiration for this whole discussion. So Milka, over to you. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be included in this panel discussion. Um, as Alice mentioned, I'm currently affiliated with Dana Farber Cancer Institute, with, where I'm supporting scientists working in cancer research field. Um, prior to that, um, I was at Cell Press for about 10 years, being editor of two research journals there. Um, and I landed in that role directly from being a researcher myself. So over the scope of my career, I wore multiple hats and I'm currently participating in publishing as a sort of advisor, consultant, um, editor, reviewer and author. Thank you. Thanks, Milka. And next is Anna Heredia. Yeah, thank you. I'm very happy and honored to be part of this panel. Um, I think that uh, it's a wonderful a way to uh, discuss and increase and improve the relationship between publishers and, and, and the researchers. Um, so I am a biologist and um, I, um, I uh, after being 
uh, some some uh, years in research. Um, I had the the opportunity to um, to be the manager of a journal's uh, department uh, at a big international publisher, uh, where I learned a lot about the other side of things and all the work that is needed to um, uh, to uh, turn a manuscript into a, a, a paper. And um, in fact, I, I started uh, this activity as, as, as a translator. I was doing translation since I was 17, uh, translating uh, different academic and scientific papers. So this was the first, um, my first contact with this, with this world. And, um, and now I work at ORCID where I'm responsible for engagement uh, in South America. And uh, yeah, we have uh, we have uh, uh, some kinds of specificities here that uh, it would be nice to discuss in the frame of this panel. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Anna. And Haseeb, you're next. Uh, hi, everybody. It's great to be on this panel. Uh, I'm based in Bangladesh, uh, Dhaka, specifically its capital. I, I often introduce myself as research enthusiast. Uh, I have I have uh, I have developed this uh, enthusiasm I think over the last 15 years or so because in 2006 uh, I got I became uh, kind of by chance actually became an uh, executive editor of one of the journals published from Bangladesh um, and I'm proudly can say that uh, this is one of the only four journals which are included from Bangladesh included in journal citation report uh, but uh, I have never been uh, uh, in any uh, academic position or research position uh, until just last year when I joined uh, University of Liberal Arts Bangladesh as a research fellow. But uh, uh, as an environmentalist or conservationist, which is my field, I work in this sector, especially on in climate change. Uh, but I have been doing research as an independent researcher, editing journal as an independent uh, researcher or as a development practitioner. That interest actually translated into me becoming a trainer, uh, mentor in some um, uh, platforms, as well as I will have been mentoring my Bangladeshi young researcher colleagues, as well as journal editor. I am also involved with uh, INASP, uh, which is an UK-based charity based in Oxford. And uh, I often write uh, in, uh, newspaper columns uh, and try to uh, increase awareness on research uh, translation, research impact, as well as uh, how to how to communicate research. And I am one of the chefs of the scholarly kitchen. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Phil. You're up next, please. Hi, my name's uh, Phil Jones. I started out my career as an academic researcher, so I had a, a pretty, you know, straightforward journey in that sense. That I, you know, went to university as an undergraduate to study physics, did a PhD in it, and then went on to do a postdoctoral research fellowship at Harvard Medical School as a biophysicist. It was after that, and after getting my first uh, appointment as a as a faculty member, that I decided to leave uh, academia and go into scholarly publishing. Um, for some reasons that might come up a little bit later in the conversation today. Well, my first job was with a Journal of Visualized Experiments, where I was their editorial director. Um, I'm very proud of the work that we did there because we created the world's first uh, video-driven uh, scientific journal, and for the time that was a very innovative thing um, to do. Um, I spent much of my career working at Digital Science as head of outreach and then a director of publishing innovation and I had a stint at Emerald Publishing as their CTO. Right now I'm an independent consultant. I work on various uh, problem, problems, products and services in, uh, in, uh, in the scholarly communication landscape, everything from infrastructure providers to, uh, to companies that are looking to either create new business models, uh, new ideas and even startups. Um, in the wider community, I, I'm a chef for the Scholarly Kitchen. Um, I write for that occasionally. I, I'm also involved in uh, the SSP annual conference uh, committee, 
uh, the researcher to read a conference and uh, most recently actually I've been involved with uh, Cargo Publishing with their Vesalius Innovation Award uh, which I thought I'd just kind of drop a, a small plug in there if you're interested in that but that's me thank you thanks Phil and last but not least Karen thank you all it's so nice to be here so um, I am my name is Karen Wolf I'm the executive director of an the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, and I'm a professor of history at William and Mary. And I love uh, Milka's uh, visual of the many hats. I love all of the many hats in many directions that uh, my colleagues here have included on their slides. I certainly um, share their um, multi-perspective um, experience as a professional. I'm prof primarily, I'm a historian. I feel like that's what I bring to almost everything I do. I do teach graduate students, um, but also as the executive director of this institute, I'm a publisher and a funder and a convener um, within the field of early American history. I'm also a blogger for the Scholarly Kitchen, um, and I do some other service um, in the scholarly communications sector. Great. Thank you all. So I hope those of you listening in will agree that, um, you know, as I said, we can't be completely comprehensive by any means, but I really do believe that um, our speakers represent a wonderful diversity um, of, of uh, experience and expertise. So we're now going to switch. We have three questions that we're going to ask um, our speakers. Um, the first of which is, as a researcher or former researcher, why did you choose to enter the publishing world? And I'm going to ask Karen this question first, because she actually still wears both hats very firmly as she mentioned um, so you haven't really made the made a made a move in either direction so maybe you could start Karen by letting us know sort of what it is I guess that appeals to you about the two different worlds that you work in or that you find challenging thank you um, well I think um, Milka referred to this um, you know in your uh, original conversation with her in your interview with her which is that researchers when they are really engaging with public research both as as well as authors um, but also as readers and consumers of that of that literature um, and I think what's interesting to me is that in the humanities um, the relationship between um, the researcher and publishing is somewhat like that we have this we are in the same process because humanities publishing is very much part of a research workflow of considering work that is ongoing in conferences and seminars and so on, that the research, the publication output is really just one stop in this much more fluid system. So in one way, I'm not really wearing multiple hats as a researcher and a publisher, it's the same hat. Um, not very many people in my field are doing it quite as explicitly as I am, um, but many of us are acting um, you know, as peer reviewers, that's true throughout the sciences as well, but also acting as editors for not just editors within a larger, um, you know, publishing entity, but as editors of independently published um, journals. So many people in my field have something like the experience I do, which is that we really have a grasp of the fuller process of which we're apart and I think that whole process is what's so exciting and I can't wait till you ask us the question about what we want people to know because I'm going to come back to the whole process <laughs> point. Okay excellent so I think this is a nice segue over to you Haseeb because you're the other one of us all who is still working as a researcher and also a publisher and like Karen you edit a journal so um, could you tell us a bit about why I guess for you you chose almost to enter the research world from the publishing world? Yeah uh... Mm -hmm. uh, I, I found uh, for many of us, as, as it happened, uh, 20 years back when I was uh, doing my master's, I became interested in research and I thought that I will build up a career as a researcher. And I did my PhD and came back in 2004. All of a sudden, there was, a, uh, there was, a, uh, there was an opening of becoming a journal, executive editor of the journal that I mentioned, Bangladesh Journal of Land Taxonomy. It was, I was quite uh, young back then, so it was uh, quite an amazing uh, uh, challenge as well as excitement. Uh, and uh, that actually brought me into publishing world. And you, you might know, the audience may know that uh, in a country like Bangladesh from Global South, there are, you can't actually, almost all the journals are society journals. And it's a very small, very confined, very tight uh, community. So you, you, know, you know many people, uh, 
but my intention was how to make this small local kind of journal to make it international. That actually uh, made me to become more interested in publishing as a whole. Uh, and uh, that actually brought me into why don't I learn and as well as in my own way, try to influence, uh, you can't influence the, uh, many, many of the senior uh, colleagues, but why don't I uh, invest time in mentoring young researchers? That actually, that shift, that interest grew, uh, although, and I continued being an uh, independent researcher. So I'm still, I believe I am. Uh, so that's how uh, I started as a researcher, became a, a journal editor or publisher, you may call it, and continue being a researcher, as uh, Karen rightly said. You can't actually, uh, differentiate that which uh, that's why i put uh, seven hats uh, in the cartoon that i just uh, posted in my slide yeah thanks thank you. and milka you started as a researcher moved into publishing and have kind of moved back to support researchers in your current job i think haven't you so how did that how did those moves happen what what, what was motivated you to sort of move from research to publishing and then into a sort of more of a research-based position Right, so um, what motivated the first sort of career transition from a research into publishing uh, was a realization that some of the interests I had uh, and some of the skills that I've built over time were more appropriate for uh, a full-time position in a role of a scientific editor than a uh, researcher. There were just some um, soul searching that went into that decision making process that suggested that um, I actually have um, some of the attributes that better translate into a publishing world in the world that's trying to identify uh, strong scientific ideas um, and um, get them published and communicated effectively more so than what it takes to be an effective, um, say, research leader uh, or a uh, PI um, in industry or in academia. So that kind of went to the first career transition where I joined Cell Press. Um, and Cell Press is one of the handful, I would say, so it's a minority publishing group that employs full-time editors. These are people that make scientific decisions um, on uh, manuscripts, um, and those are the people that guide the peer review process from start to finish um, full time, as opposed to most of the journals that um, are guided by um, usually um, people that have their independent research careers in the in industry or academia, and then part time are involved in guiding journals as editor-in-chiefs or uh, associate editors and things like that. And then my second career back to research um, happened because I was looking for, as people sometimes do, um, to take myself yet again out of the comfort zone and um, learn something new and do something new. Um, and since I remain very close to the research community, given the type of uh, editorial role I had, uh, it was basically just sliding back into the research community I was close with anyways. Um, and what I'm currently trying to do um, as a part of my responsibilities is um, basically just help a lot of people that are at the very beginning of their research careers uh, navigate some of the complexities of the current um, research, publishing, evaluation, grant system that we have in place. Well, we're definitely going to come back and talk a bit more about that. Um, but first of all, Anna, I think your career has in a way um, somewhat mirrored Milka's. So you started as a researcher, then moved into publishing, and now you're working in research infrastructure, sort of supporting researchers from that perspective. Can you tell us a bit about your sort of decision making along the way? Sure. I have to, to begin saying that <clears throat> I was always uh, divided between the biology 
and uh, what we call here in, in, in Brazil or in Spanish, in Portuguese, the letters, right? Which is writing, reading, and uh, this, um, this proximity with, uh, with, uh, yeah, with print, right? With books and, and articles. So this was, at the beginning, I was thinking which way I was going to take. And then I decided to move forward with the biology. And, but as I said before, always working as a translator. Uh, every time that I needed a little bit of money, that I needed an extra money, I, I translated um, mainly uh, academic and scientific uh, papers. And this was, for me, this was a very, uh, very grateful um, contribution uh, to, the, to the scholarly communication. Uh, and I never stopped doing that, right, until I, I, I get a, a formal job. Um, so the passion for scholarly communication began as a translator. And, and then I decided to pursue in research. And while all my colleagues uh, didn't like to write their papers, didn't like to write their thesis, for me, this was the most um, rewarding moment because all the pieces of the puzzle, all the pieces of everything that you've been working for, for years sometimes, uh, finally got a form and, and made sense. So um, this also was a, a very nice um, finding in the process of, of doing research. And then after some, several years doing research, uh, I, I specialize in ants behavior. Um, and uh, this was always my, my passion. Uh, but I decided to join, uh, to, to make a change like Milka, like, you know, get out of the comfort zone and, uh, and uh, experiment uh, other things. In my case, I really wanted to, to experiment the other side of things. And so I took a, the opportunity of joining um, Elsevier in Brazil, and um, where I had several different positions, um, uh, some positions into the uh, marketing and sales department, where I realized that writing an article, a scientific article, is a piece of marketing, right? Somehow, uh, we need to write it in, a, in, a, in an appealing way, um, it's like you, your paper is disputing in a pile of papers to be read first, right? And to be cited first. So you have to have a catchy um, title and, and you have to think about several things to engage the, the reader. So um, in this, so at Elsevier I had the, the possibility, and this was, I think, one of the most interesting experiences in my, in my career, I had, I had the, the, the possibility to manage a journals department at a national level. And it was uh, very, very interesting to see and to, and to work with all the people involved in all this process, uh, the authors, uh, the, the, the editors, the translators, the, 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 the print process and uh, the indexing, all the process of indexing a journal, cr creating a journal, because I, I had the experience to advise a society to create their first journal. Now it is indexed in, 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 in EASY, in ISI. So it's a, this is a, a very important thing that I, I, I helped him to, to build a journal. So, yeah. Um, That's great. This is, and, and, now, yeah, and now I'm at ORCID working with research infrastructure. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Anna. And Phil, um, you really have made a similar move, sort of going from um, a researcher into more of a publishing role and then mostly um, sort of research infrastructure type roles from, from then on, I think, haven't you? Yes, yeah. And I, I actually transitioned away from being a, an academic researcher fairly early on. Um, I suppose in my career, I I did my PhD as I said earlier at, uh, at Imperial, and then and then spent five years, or nearly there six years at uh, Harvard Medical School, slogging away to get to the point of actually getting my first faculty position. And it was then that I kind of reevaluated where things were going. And over that course of that postdoc, it's a very common experience I think for researchers to discover the sort of researcher they want to be, to identify you know, where they want to work, what sort of uh, questions they want to ask and how they want to answer them. And I reached the conclusion that 
the kind of scientist that I wanted to be, I would find it really very difficult to get funding because there was a drive towards or an emphasis on hypothesis driven research to the ex to the extent that the that that good methodology and and good practice um, can often suffer you know there was too much focus i felt on being the first person to say something exciting and cool and new and not enough on scientific rigor which is why i left academia to join Jove. My thinking at the time was that as a journal that was focused on the documentation of methodologies and techniques, it would be a good way for me to help provide a platform for technically driven and techniques driven and methodologi methodologically driven researchers to be able to communicate more fully and, and receive more um, more credit for for the work that they did so that's really why i made the transition is i thought that if i don't like the way the game is being played i shan't keep banging my head against a brick wall i want to go and you know join the industry that is responsible for making the rules and as i learned a little bit later through my career it's not quite that simple to change the rules so that's that's how i spent that's how i spent the rest of my career excellent thank you thanks all so this this is really good context i think for our next couple of questions so the first one is, what would you most like your, if you're a re, as a, with your researcher hat on, what would you most like your publisher to know about what it's like to be a researcher? Or with your publisher hat on, what would you most like um, your researchers to know about it being, um, about being a, a publisher? And I guess this is a sort of, you know, challenges, opportunities thing, and you can go in either direction. Um, so Milka, I'm going to start with you because I know this is something that you have strong views on with your with your multiple hats. So what what what? I'm guessing you're probably going to answer this from the point of view of the researcher. Um, and what would you most like the publisher to know about about um, being a researcher? Um, so I can probably offer a very brief answer to what would what would I would have liked researchers to know about when I was on an editorial site is how much volume you need to deal with as an editor and how little opportunity you have to really, um, you know, take time to make this more personal. And that's something that I feel researchers would like publisher and editors to focus on a little bit more how to make publishing less of a black box without clear guidance, without clear um, help. Where do you find answers to any questions you may need when you're approaching a journal? Um, every journal is different, which makes the publishing ecosystem very complex to navigate. Every journal has preferred reference format. Every journal has preferred fonts or styles. Or, um, it becomes quite hard as a researcher to understand that. It's also very hard for researchers to get the actual feel for the culture of each individual journal. What can I expect uh, from the editorial process? What, what can I expect from the, the publishing process? Uh, what sort of interactions? will I encounter? Um, that is very hard for early, especially early career researchers to appreciate. And it makes a huge difference in how the whole publishing experience goes for them. Um, so if publishers can do one thing is perhaps think about how can we be more similar than different? Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. I know my limited experience of publishing um, when I was a, a publisher I thought it was um, you know uh, manuscript submission systems and things were fantastic but uh, the experience as a, an author and a reviewer is a little can be a little different um, uh, so so what makes sense to one community may not make sense to the other um, Karen do you want to follow on from that a bit because I think a lot of what you do as a historian is publish in books rather than journals and I know the experience there I think is Quite different. So, from a from a historian's perspective, what do you think it's most important for publishers to know about you as a researcher? Well, I think um, I want to take this question in a slightly different direction, if you don't mind. Go for it. <laughs> Which is that what I what I would love is um, not so much for the publishers who work in my 
um, discipline and field. Um, so for books, for book disciplines like mine, um, you know, university presses are enormously important. And I think university presses are actually pretty well attuned to the needs of their researcher authors. I think um, what I would love is for publishing as a whole to just have a better grasp of how differently fields and disciplines function so that publishers don't make assumptions about how the work that they do in biomedical, you know, actually can be um, can be assumed to relate to or to be applicable in any way to other fields. I think that's an enormous problem, actually, and it's a problem downstream for researchers because sometimes when giant publishers who are more attuned to working in, um, in STEM fields then start to publish in the humanities, they import practices that just aren't functional, really, for narrative-based, argument-based, um, close textual work kinds of um, disciplines. So it's not so much the publishers in my field that I want to know more, it's actually publishing writ large that I want to um, have a better grasp of a researcher's need in different disciplines. And I think, I mean, I think we've all discussed this before. It's an issue with research infrastructure as well. I don't want to, I don't want to get sucked down that rabbit hole, but I think, you know, many of the same challenges exist there. So um, Anna and Phil, maybe you could speak, not, I said, I don't want to go down the infrastructure uh, rabbit hole, but since you both have backgrounds in infrastructure, is there anything you would like to add from a publisher perspective or, uh, or from a research perspective about publishing or vice versa? Yeah, um, yeah. I think that um, thinking back then, well, we submitted an article by sending it by email to the to the to the to the editor, and now we have several systems. And I think that from the author's perspective, uh, there is a lot of um, confusion using these systems, adapting to one and the other regarding ORCID, in terms of ORCID perspective, um, although they can use the public API, it's not very easy sometimes for them to integrate that, especially when we talk about small publishers, university journals here in Latin America. The majority of the journals that we have are, and, and it was very interesting to, to hear from Haseb that um, in his region, uh, the majority of journals belong to societies. I would say that in Latin America, the majority of journals are linked to universities, mm -hmm. meaning, that, um, meaning that the person who is running the journal is a researcher, uh, a research administrator, uh, you know, uh, uh, all the heads at the time, and, he, and this person can only do this part-time if... if uh, so small journals struggle a lot with submission system, with infrastructure, and with all the best practices uh, that are internationally uh, recognized. Uh, but there are some organizations that play a very important role uh, in, in that. Uh, for example, Cielo, uh, which is an indexing database, but it's also a network of 13 countries and is also um, responsible, or, or they took this head to, to disseminate best practices and to help the small journals to reach out to certain levels and um, and, uh, and and other organizations like Redalic and, and also the associations of scientific editors of some countries have uh, uh, very clearly established, like Brazil, for example, and other countries are still struggling to uh, transform their forums of editorial of editors into uh, societies that help uh, to 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 um, bridge that gap i think and mm -hmm. and just to to answer to answer to the question i think that one of the problems uh, uh is that in, in the big publishers um sometimes people working there have no idea what the research process is and what does it mean uh for an, an author to be sending an article right um to this journal the amount of work the amount of stress the amount of uncertainties uh, that every submission uh, represents, right? Yeah. So it's like sending a bottle, uh, a message in a bottle in the ocean, right? You don't know what's going to happen, right? Yeah, that's a great analogy. Thank you. <laughs> Phil, is there anything you'd like to add? 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, I like the I like the story about the 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 old ways that uh, submissions used to come into journals and and how relatively recently that was. I remember between being a PhD student and and going off to my to my uh, job in America, there was a, a time period where I you know was 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 temping effectively, and for a short time I was an editorial assistant at a large commercial publisher. And one of the workflows that was still in existence is that we would get manila envelopes with three printed copies of people's manuscripts in them which we would then mail out to three different reviewers um so that was that was still going on even after you know and it's not that long it's not that long ago really it was certainly after the invention of the internet um so yeah so i think that i think that one of the i mean one of the things that i think that to kind of look at the basic question of you know what would you like um you know what would you like uh what would you like publishers to kind of know about researchers? I think one of the one of the biggest things that's really underappreciated, or researchers think is underappreciated, is just how time poor they are. You know, and in many cases, kind of how precarious their positions are. You know, particularly when it comes to interacting with things like their submission systems and you know production workflows and things like that, it can feel really very frustrating when you find yourself in this kind of endless cyclic Sisyphean kind of submission and resubmission and rejection kind of process that that uh, that researchers find themselves in you know and that's and that's can be very very stressful so I think it would be really good it's a really positive move for for publishers to think about how they can streamline their enterprise architecture and their infrastructure and their workflows and align those two things to make the user experience, if you like, much more intuitive and much more pleasant and much more empathetic, particularly for authors as they are very often trying to do something that's really important for their personal careers and can mean the difference between getting hired or not hired. You know, it can mean their contract being renewed or they can end up losing their job and sometimes even, you know, have to take a different career path. So I think minimizing that stress level, I think, can be done by looking carefully at how your enterprise infrastructure interacts with your workflows to make it as less stressful as possible. I think one of the themes that's going to come up a lot in this discussion has already is diversity in types of researchers. And the kind of little bit of that that I like to introduce is the way in which researchers' needs and wants change as they move through their careers. I think very often a lot of publishers spend time talking to more senior researchers and so you know through editorial boards conferences and so forth and so their view of what researchers want to need is seen through that lens but people earlier on in their career may want different things now people talk about ecrs um and if you look at some of the work around ecrs it's very often focused on the fact that very early career researchers just need a foot on the ladder right and as a result they are sometimes not quite as engaged in you know, in in how scholarly publishing needs to change, because really they just need that paper in order to get on the next step. But then this this kind of mid career kind of stage where people um, start to really take an interest in how science and research works as a whole, and those people really want to communicate and collaborate in much more complete and more efficient and better ways. And I think they need to be really carefully listened to. Um, so that's the so that's the thing that I would say is to kind of look at how needs change and it's not just ECRs versus senior researchers there's there's several stages kind of along the way Thanks, all right so in the interest of time I, I won't talk so much about what I think <laughs> researchers should know about publishers I'll, I'll let us move on thank you and yes Hasib, I'm going to come to you in just a minute um, because I think um, Phil's point about diversity is well made and I think that there are probably um, you know similar challenges when you're working in the global south but i know karen you have to leave in just a minute so i wanted to just give you the opportunity to um say any last words or answer briefly the last question if you would like to before you go um so i, I could i just uh what is do you have the last slide up there alice is that what you wanted to shift to? What, yes, whichever you want. I mean, I just really wanted to give you the option to, okay. to... Well, can I actually go back to something Phil said about um, yes. how mid-career folks um, begin to be interested in the whole relationship between research and publishing? And I think actually that's, that's really a problem. I don't think we want that to happen. I think we want um, researchers at even the earliest stage of their career to understand how their research fits into this broader um, workflow and how their work as professionals is related to the work of editorial folks as professionals, is related to folks who are designing infrastructure 
as professionals. I think that really needs to be baked in. In other words, if we're just, um, you know, uh, training is such a bad word, but if we're just training researchers who are focused only on the specific thing that's on the desk in front of them and not understanding how they fit into the larger world, I think we're doing them and us a disservice. Thank you. And I'm sorry you have Thanks to leave everyone. early, but thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. And Haseeb, sorry, um, but over back back to you, please. Um, and if you could tell us a little bit about what you would most like your publisher to know about what it's like working as a researcher and vice versa. Uh, I think there are uh, two aspects to that. If I just, uh, if I uh, want uh, researchers from the Global South to want to know that what, what uh, under which condition, or what, what's the context where uh, publishers actually working in. Uh, much uh, has been said about uh, uh, big publisher. I just want to focus on how smaller publishers actually work in, 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 in a country like Bangladesh or elsewhere. Uh, they are mostly voluntary, almost all actually. There is no uh, APC, it's free, always open access. So you are, uh, as uh, Anna rightly said, one person uh, representing the society, editorial board, often they review it and it's a, such a such a such a close uh, community so researchers should understand that that volunteerism uh, so you we need to appreciate that uh, that is very important uh, maybe not uh, in terms of the volume uh, not much manuscript they are receiving but the effort they have to uh, put into the other thing is uh, I always value, in, when I was a young researcher, I always value the interaction from uh, my editors. Uh, uh, and when I was a young editor, uh, some time back, uh, I, as I said, I wanted to make my kind of Bangladeshi uh, journals, journal publishing, Bangladeshi research, I wanted to make it kind of global. So I was inviting papers from many countries, obviously, and there are countries where English is not the first language. I can still remember how closely uh, I, I had my charm, uh, time, my enthusiasm. I closely worked with those authors to respond to the reviewers. You can't expect that now. Even my journal, which is now quite, uh, quite, uh, quite busy, impossible. But that human touch, uh, I must say that when we talked about infrastructure, yes, still we receive a manuscript, no more, um, no more CDs or printed copies, but definitely email. Um, in Bangladeshi, I believe I know about 150 journals, which are actually posted by Bangla Jol, Bangladesh Journal Online. It has been in operation since 2007. But still, I know that nobody, almost nobody, is using the online submission, online review, online uh, processing. You know, because I think there is a kind of an inertia or kind of discomfort interacting with machine. But interestingly, same people, they're doing it when they are submitting journal elsewhere. I don't know how, how, how you define it. But uh, researchers should, should know that, uh, that aspect of uh, publishers. And publishers also need to focus on uh, young researchers, especially on mid-career researchers' enthusiasm. But I very much appreciate what, what Phil actually said. Publishers, especially in Global South and researchers, they need to understand the whole spectrum. They often think about their own journals, not interacting with other journals. Just, just It is like each and every institution should have a journal. Why? That's, that, that's that kind of a mentality. You need to train. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a long debate. Uh, maybe it, it will come up in a later question. Thank you. Thanks, Asib. And actually, I think I'm going to stay with you, if I may, to ask you the last question, um, which is what one thing would you most like your, um, you can choose whichever you want to answer this, you're either your publisher or your researcher to do differently? Uh, I think I would. Uh, I, I would omit the slash between publisher and researchers. They are part of the same team, isn't it? Uh, they are two different <clears throat> stakeholders, but there are uh, the research users, uh, funders, uh, the government who is actually funding, who is demanding research outputs. But especially what we do with our research outputs, our papers, promotion, scholarships, position, 
so how universities or university commissions, I mean, the, the whole decision-making body, they are actually valuing those research outputs. Uh, still in Bangladesh, number counts, I'm sorry to say on record. Uh, it is not the quality, but the number. Uh, so it's, the, it's the putting an undue pressure uh, on researchers, at least uh, from my personal experience. So my uh, uh, comment would be publishers and researchers, they need to understand they have to work together to make it comfortable for both stakeholders. Uh, uh, and I would uh, lean into uh, making early career researchers' life more comfortable or more uh, acceptable. And uh, definitely they need to understand the reality, but uh, sometimes I feel like it's just a mad world, it's crazy. Yeah, so I, I want them to work together. That's a, I think that's a great point. Um, so working as a team is one thing that uh, seeing each other as being part of the same team is a, is, a, is an excellent thing. Anna, what about you? Um, you, ha you have a, um, you know, also a Global South perspective. Do you, would you echo what Haseeb said? Is there anything else that you would like to see publishers and researchers doing differently? Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I agree with Haseeb. I think we have uh, specific challenges in the Global South. I would like to jump into something you just said about the English, right? Uh, uh, the fact that uh, most researchers are not English speakers or English um, used uh, people makes the, make it, it, it difficult for them to interact with the submission system, to understand what is being required and, and what is being required and, and why, to interact with the editor, right? to go through the peer review process where you have to understand what the reviewers are saying, that you have to reply to that. So I think there are many barriers. And, and one of the barriers I would like to address is the fact that non-English speaking authors, of course, have maybe uh, less quality papers, let's say, because the message is being, con being conveyed in a language that is not theirs. And, and this accounts for a lot when the editor receives a paper um, uh, where it's not well written, uh, you don't know, the, the phrases are truncated or something like that. They just refuse it right away, right, at the editor step. They, it, it doesn't even go further in the process. And, and of course, uh, 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 local journals spend, and authors spend a lot of money on these translations to make sure that this, this, this step is overcome, right? But there is still this point, which is very important. And another one is how um, how likely is a is a paper to be published in a big journal, an important journal, if only Global South researchers are in the authors, mm -hmm. right? When there is not a, a one big personality of the Global North included in the co-authors. I, I'm just leaving this as a provocative. Yeah. No, no, no. I think it's a really good point. And I think, um, Phil, I'm going to move to you next because you already raised, I think, the diversity issue. And this is very much part of it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to add a little bit of weight to that, I mean, um, I'm sure that Don Samalak won't mind me um, paraphrasing him and, and kind of hopefully not misquoting him. He was, I remember having a conversation with him a while ago about authors in some regions um, receiving uh, a letter, an acceptance letter from a journal uh, with, you know, an English language journal and finding the language so esoteric that they're unable to tell whether the paper has been accepted or rejected. And I think that's a really important thing to take notice of when we look at things like um, like the wording in editorial decision letters and we look at instructions for authors. One thing that I note about instructions for authors is when I was a researcher, I never read them. <laughs> Don't read them. Right. The way that you figure out how to submit to a journal and what those and what that paper should look like is you talk to somebody in your department, usually your boss, who has published with them before. And they will say, Oh yeah, it's you know, it's use EndNote and it's this particular, you know, citation code to generate the right sorts of citations and you know, and, and this is, you know, you look at the paper, you know, perhaps look at the order of the headings. You don't actually look at the instructions for authors and pick through it. Right. There's a lot of there's a lot of, um, you know, tacit knowledge 
about how to interact with the scholarly publishing system of the global north that we take for granted. You know, one of the things I always used to say is, you know, it's it's one of those things that you've known so long you've forgotten you learnt it. And I think that's a really important thing that we have that empathy with people who are not from our background and culture and from the global north or our communities um, so that we make things much more accessible. And I think, you know, part of that is possibly, you know, road testing, you know, in the way that, um, you know, agile product development is done. Road test your um, your instructions for authors or your decision letters with people from other communities and see if what you're doing is easy enough to understand. You know, and if not, simplify it, make it easier. Yeah, and that is the flip side, I think, of the fact that we have to sort of bear in mind that changes in technology have made, have changed the way that people communicate. You know, so if you look in the, you know, in the in, in mass media, um, particularly things like social media, the way that we use language and the way that we use media and video and audio has completely changed. And part of that is the influence of other different cultures on that's no longer have this kind of cultural hegemony based in Europe and North America. And we need to, as an industry, be more innovative around our value propositions, you know, and perhaps slaughter a few sacred cows and, and create new and interesting and innovative um, products and services that, that can, you know, meet the needs of, you know, the next generation of researchers. Mm. Absolutely, thank you. And Milka, I want to give the last um, word to you since since uh, uh, you inspired the topic for this discussion. Um, so uh, probably maybe hard to pick just one thing, but if you could pick one thing, what would you most like your publishers researchers to do differently? Right. So I I'm not going to comment what the what I would like most, but what could potentially be useful. Um, okay. And just to make a comment on Phil's approach to reading instructions for authors, I am one of those people that read everything because I wanted <laughs> to make sure. <laughs> and it didn't help at the end because it's all covered in some sort of user unfriendly language that you, even if you paid attention to everything in the end, you don't actually end up with what people need from you. Um, so, That's anyway. exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> So, um, but, and my comment is to be taken as uh, biased towards biomedical research community, uh, because that's where I live. Um, uh, and, and to build, it's building on something that we have heard multiple times mentioned in the past in this panel, uh, that um, authors that, that we are dealing with, um, don't feel comfortable being authors. They don't feel comfortable be creating written pieces of information, are not native English speakers, uh, are not comfortable with writing. Um, I mean, that's what we heard from Anna, that's what we heard from others. Uh, Karen would probably have a different perspective because the language becomes the output of her discipline. But in hard sciences, Data is mostly the output of your discipline, your observations, how accurately you are reporting what you've seen, how accurately and reproducibly you are doing your science, how accurately are you documenting things, um, and how accurately you are interpreting your results. And from that perspective, something that I've been thinking recently is, can we get rid of this authorship thing? Is there a need for people to be writing papers the way they are written now? Are there other ways in which we can break the need for introductions that if you're working on a specific protein in cancer field, introductions are pretty much rewritten over and over again in the same way because we're all starting from the same point if we share the research interest in this one player in the cancer field. So, can we revisit that? And that's something that publishers and researchers need to do in collaboration. Again, mentioning what Hasib said, remove the slash. Um, is there a way that publishers can help research community rethink how are, um, say, researchers evaluated? 
and what what are the parameters of research evaluation that should change and then can publishers help in reorganizing perhaps killing some of the say a couple of sacred house that phil mentioned um to help restructure this in a way that can help at least people that are working in more of a, a science part of things do things differently um, so these are some of the things that we can i guess discuss in a q a session Yes, oh, it feels like um, we could have a, another whole discussion um, devoted to, to, to that. Um, that's a wonderful way to end. Thank you very much, Milka. And thank you, Anna, Haseeb and Phil as well. I really appreciate all of you and Karen in her absence for a really interesting and engaging conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.